attorneys. He will tell us why and how to fight foreclosure and discuss the issues surrounding the bank's ability to foreclose. Shame that so many people are here for a topic of foreclosure. Yeah. Uh, we all wish we had better things to do with our lives. But uh, <clears throat> I mean, it's part of what we live with now. I got into the foreclosure legal area through a friend who had problems. He'd been a client of mine for many years. And after I stopped practicing law, because uh, I'm not retired in the sense that I don't work. Uh, I've got my week down to 55 or 60 hours. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't practice law. But, uh, but through having a friend with a problem he had in another state that involved foreclosure and some things that were really strange in the courts, uh, I, I guess I stuck my nose too deep into the materials <laughs> and uh, spent a few years going through a thousand or so cases, foreclosure cases around the United States, and that resulted in this first book, and, um, and the bottom line is, is and the reason I kept working on this was that uh, I have a lot of respect for our legal system. Uh, when I was trained in law school about the, the objectives, what we're supposed to be doing, how we're supposed to cooperate with the courts and the attorneys. It made sense to me, and I thought it gave us uh, a strength in our country that uh, is something to be proud of. Uh, in the foreclosure arena, things that happen by the, what I call the foreclosure machine are, are really terrible. They, they uh, deceive the courts. They are very good at deceptive wordsmithing, so they'll play with words that they know it will be, it will be misunderstood, but they use them anyway with the purpose of having them misunderstood. Our judges, uh, for the most part, are overworked. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard to find any judge that doesn't have thou literally thousands of cases uh, on their docket that they're responsible for. The way to fight back against this foreclosure machine is to help the judges, so I stress that as much as I can, and to put on a case that's in language that the judge can understand. It doesn't have to be legalese. It can be English. It just needs to, <laughs> but it needs to be something that tracks what the judges are there to do. They're not there to make public policy. They're not there to legislate. Judges uh, have their job to, which requires them to apply the current law to what the current facts are. And because of their workloads, if, if uh, two parties are in a lawsuit and only one of them ever opens their mouth, that's the only story the judge will ever hear. So it's, a, uh, it's really important to, to try to, to cooperate with the judges. They're humans. They make mistakes sometimes. And that's the reason we have appellate courts. And in fact, when I mentioned that I looked at over a thousand cases and analyzed foreclosure decisions around the country, I'm looking at appellate decisions for the most part. The lower court decisions don't get published in the legal re research tools that are available online and electronically. But this, uh, and I, I'm not sure, I may have been correct, it said that uh, in some ways, the public is helpless. Uh, I don't see that. Uh, I had too much success in court. And I do think that if judges are presented the right facts and the right law, uh, they will give a correct decision. But it's a learning process. And there, there's nothing simple about it. There's no guarantee. If the first judge gets it wrong, a person may have to go to appellate court to get a, a better reason decision. It's just the way it is. My, uh, my book, and you can't see it from there, but I, I just take my word for it. It says, don't assume they win, even if you're behind on the mortgage payments. 
Now, uh, that is not cute uh, marketing spiel. It's up there because what I learned over the years was that most people only know one side of the equation. They know if they made a payment or not. They have absolutely no idea what happened with their note. They don't know who it was sold to. They don't know if the people sending letters had any rights to demand payments. The borrower doesn't know if uh, their loan has already been paid off through the use of the insurance or endorsement warranties or settlement where the investors on Wall Street have sued the big banks that, for packaging uh, misrepresented uh, loan packages. Uh, borrowers don't know any of this information. So many people, uh, and most borrowers by the way, uh, I think the, Chris talked about this report, this financial uh, crisis inquiry report, 600 and some odd pages. That report uh, has a, a discussion in there about the FBI investigating what caused the problems. And the FBI said that they could find no quantifiable evidence at all that borrower fraud or borrower misrepresentation led to the crisis. They couldn't even quantify it. It was all through the industry. And that's in the report that Chris was talking about. The, uh, there are many good people trying to solve the problem. Uh, some people are working in political arenas. Some people are trying to change legislation. And uh, I get confused easily. I have a lot easier time with things that are more short term. So that's the reason I focus on litigation. My book is about foreclosure litigation. My papers are about foreclosure litigation. To the extent that I can, I try to take the legalese and put it in plain language. Uh, and people tell me, even when I get plain language, that I don't get there sometimes. But that's my objective. That's what I try to do. The, uh, I, re I refer to the foreclosure machine all the time. And that's because, based on all the cases I've studied, based on the attorneys I know in different states who are practicing, Whoever shows up at your door demanding a payment uh, under threat of foreclosure, they're all cut from the same cloth. They have been schooled the same way. They use the same type of practices and tactics in the foreclosure process. Uh, there are differences, of course, whether a state is a non-judicial foreclosure or a judicial foreclosure state. But the, the type of approach they use to take a person's home from it. Uh, very little difference anywhere nationwide. And so I, I refer to this body of foreclosure shops as the foreclosure machine. Makes no difference to me if it's uh, if the person at the door says I'm with Wells Fargo, US Bank, Deutsche. To me they're all exactly the same and I've yet to see evidence to the contrary. But it's not a term that you'll find in the law per se. <laughs> Just uh, so we heads up on that. The, the foreclosure machine uh, has bigger names than we do. It has more money. It has more legal resources. So it's understandable that people will uh, be intimidated and will be concerned that they have any chance at all of a fair hearing, any chance of uh, really having their rights determined properly. But uh, the fact is that the foreclosure machine in court is very predictable, which means there are things that can be done to head them off the pass, if you will. The foreclosure machine makes mistakes. They make mistakes in what they do in the court process, and so often they are burdened by mistakes that were made when the loans were originally created many, many years ago. And they can't fix those. The, the problem with the, the, the foreclosure machine has is that so often it cannot establish the legal rights to demand payment, cannot establish, establish the legal, legal right to foreclose because of something that happened in the past that can't be fixed now. 
they play games, they try to um, hide it, keep it uh, below the surface, but that is the, that happens frequently. The South Essex County in Massachusetts did an audit of foreclosures in that one county for the year of 2010, and they only looked at foreclosures by J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, and Wells Fargo. On just those players, or mortgages foreclosed in those names, the county found that 75% of those foreclosures were illegal. San Francisco County, uh, which is where San Francisco is located, did an audit. They looked at three years of foreclosures in that county, uh, 2009, 2010, 2011. They came up with 84% of their foreclosures were illegal. The, the U.S. Office of the Comptroller of the Currency uh, issued a report in April of this year, the results of an audit they conducted, and they looked at just two years, 2009, 2010. And they looked at the, at the foreclosures that were in progress or that actually closed in those two years. The OCC's report said that they found 4.2 million illegalities in the foreclosures. Well, we, in this country, we've only been averaging about 2 million foreclosures a year. So that, that's effectively saying that they found something wrong with every foreclosure they looked at. Um, now, I mean, these, these, these numbers are, are sort of interesting, but the reality is, is that as a result of these studies, nobody was given their house back. That's not what the government's about. Uh, I mean, they did study, but it hasn't resulted in homes being given back. The settlement agreement between the federal government and the state attorney general offices didn't uh, actually delve deep enough into facts to identify the people who had their homes taken in property and make some compensation for them. That wasn't what the settlements were for. They were primarily, at least in my opinion, I think they were primarily to to get rid of a stigma that was growing, a bad uh, blight on the reputation of these huge U.S. financial institutions. Unfortunately, people are pretty much on their own. Uh, if you wait, if a person's got a foreclosure notice right now, they need help now, and that's going to be the court. Uh, political solutions, legislative changes aren't going to help the person that is facing foreclosure today. And, and that's what the, uh, my materials are about, trying to provide information to help people, uh, both attorneys and, and their clients alike. The debt collection process is misunderstood. Uh, the foreclosure is nothing but debt collection. And the fact that they throw out words like mortgages, promissory notes, and securitization, the bottom line is that's all a foreclosure is. If somebody says, I want some money, I've got collateral, and I want to foreclose, I want to sell the collateral to get my money out of uh, It's got a few more words than that, but that's the essence of what a foreclosure is. The, the nature of foreclosure is to make whole the person that's owed the money. What you'll see as you do more studies is that the machine that shows up that demands payments and threats to take the houses, they rarely, when they are put to a test, they rarely can prove that they have the right to make a demand for payment. They have difficulty proving they have the right to foreclose. The, um, in my works, I don't spend a lot of time talking about the mortgage. And that's because the mortgage, especially in New Mexico, the mortgage is incidental. It is secondary to the note. The mortgage is collateral for a performance under this note. The person that controls the note, they owe the money under the note, they're the ones that control the collateral, the mortgage. In fact, there are court decisions in New Mexico uh, that basically say that. Whoever controls that note has a right to the collateral whether their name is on the mortgage or not. Uh, I don't spend that much time with mortgage. Uh, I look at mortgages and, and give suggestions on how to challenge the assignments of mortgages, uh, but 
quite often that is that leads to information that can help show that the the company demanding the payments and threatening foreclosure doesn't have proof. But I, my primary focus is the note itself, the promise to pay. A foreclosure is never legal unless there's a default under the note. Now this I'm not talking about a default like Luke Dare was talking about where somebody doesn't show up, they don't respond to a lawsuit. I'm talking about there has to be a default under the note. The, uh, the banks, Wall Street, uh, our federal government for the most part, will talk as if any time a payment is missed, there's a default. Well, that's not the law. That isn't the way it works. You're, even if your note says that a condition of default or a default happens if you don't make your payments, that very same document gives the authority to the, the, the person in control of the note to decide if there's a default. Gives that person the sole authority to decide if there's an acceleration of the debt. Gives that person the authority to decide if there's going to be a triggering of the power of sale under a mortgage. That that's the foreclosure start. So many people that are sued, if they answer a lawsuit quite often, they'll say, well, I'm in default. I didn't make my payments. And they say that because they're ignorant. They don't know what the law is. If they have not been contacted by the person that's in charge of the note and, and they have received that declaration of default, they're not in default. It hasn't happened. That is, uh, that's the, uh, the law that is a composite reading, if you will, of the loan documents themselves, the, the note, the mortgage, and then the body of law that controls the issues about rights and obligations under the note. And that's the Uniform Commercial Code. So I spent a lot of time talking about the UCC. When I was in law school, ne I never took a course about the UCC. I never knew an attorney that had taken a course about the UCC. Although I assumed that one of the professors who taught UCC uh, probably had. But, but in real estate foreclosures before, this, uh, before the, two, the 2000s started, uh, people did not talk about the UCC in foreclosures. It wasn't until the securitization took place and these notes started being dealt with as if they are tradable securities. That's what created the importance of the UCC in the foreclosure world. The, the approach in a lawsuit against the company that says, oh, good to show me money, if you don't pay me, I'm going to take your house. And I'm probably going to get a deficiency against you in the state of New Mexico. When that kind of shows up, the purpose of going to court against it is to make it prove what it says. To put it to a test under the law, a strict test that's very complicated, and to get past all of the rhetoric, get past the hot talk, get past the smoke and mirrors, Make them show. That's where the UCC comes in. The UCC is a body of law that defines rights and obligations under a negotiable instrument. And I'm talking about Article 3. The UCC has all kinds of stuff in it. But Article 3 is about negotiable instruments. Negotiable instruments are a big body of uh, types of papers. The basic essence of a negotiable instrument is it's got to have an amount that's due that can be understood by reading the document, when the payment is due, and it has to be transferable. Those are basically the three things. If you read the sections in the UCC about negotiable instrument uh, and you stayed awake, uh, you'd find that there, there, are all kinds of, there are all kinds of words in there and sentences and all kinds of stuff that seems confusing. The essence of the litigation about whether something is or is not a negotiable instrument typically comes down to is there a principal amount that's fixed and stated? Is there a payment schedule that we can understand? And is, it a, is there any restriction on transferability? Residential notes don't have transferability restrictions. So as soon as the borrower is at a mortgage closure and they hand the, uh, their notes and their documents to the lender, that lender can sell the 
paper, it could sell it, trade it, give it away, burn it up. And the borrower has no right to know what's happening. The loans do not give the borrower any right to know what has been done with their paperwork after they give it to the lender. But they get letters in the mail saying you owe some money or here's a new service or that kind of thing happens. Because this is a negotiable instrument, the residential loan is, that note uh, puts the borrower at risk that somebody's going to show up with a copy of it or with the original and they're going to knock on the door and say, oh, by the way, I got this piece of paper that you signed years ago and you owe me some money. And if you don't give it to me, I'm going to take your house. Well, the UCC is the law that says, hey, uh, we need protections for who signed these things. They need to be protected against somebody stealing the note, somebody, you know, four or five people all coming up with copies and all making demands on the same thing. The UCC gives the borrower the right to demand. Whoever is showing up to, uh, saying, I want your money or your house, the UCC says you've got the right to demand proof. What proof do they have that they have the right to enforce that note? The UCC says if they don't provide the proof, there is no obligation on the borrower to comply with their demands. The, the UCC says, borrower, you also have a responsibility. If you pay your money to the wrong person, you get no credit on the account of who you actually owe the money to. I mean, that, it's, it's, this negotiable instrument is not, it, it's, uh, it's complicated when these valuable pieces of paper can float around anywhere. But the UCC is a protection. The UCC is the law that says when you go to court, you can demand that the person making claims against you prove it with facts. Well, my, uh, my book and the papers and you know, what I routinely do, some might follow the same pattern. My chapter 9 says don't accept the machine's word. Don't take their word on anything is a good rule of thumb. They may be nice people. I mean, you don't have to take their word. <laughs> chapter 10 says gather and use facts to beat the machine. That's because the UCC creates fact-intensive tests. And the way you beat the machine, unless they just admit it or go away on their own, which doesn't happen very often, but the way you beat them is that you make them prove the facts, show the facts that, the, that they say support their claim against you. And what you'll quite often, when they're put under this pressure, what the machine does is that it, it may... Uh, have something up here for one year, and then there's nothing at all for a year, and then something comes up down here, and all of these gaps, uh, basically if they can't be filled in and explained with fact, not with just hot words and talk, they can't be approved with fact as to what was going on with the note itself, the machine should lose in court. The burden of proof is on the machine. In New Mexico, and we're fortunate because this is a judicial foreclosure state. The, the people wanting to foreclose have to start the lawsuit. That puts them under a burden, a burden of having to prove standing, a burden of having to prove whatever their claims are. They, you know, that burden can shift. If they put on a little bit, you know, a little bit of a show, they could possibly shift the burden to the defendant. But because you have a right to use discovery in a lawsuit to get facts, it's the facts that keep the burden in the back of the foreclosure machine. The facts, they will not have facts to show why they've got an assignment that says they, they got a, their name on a, on a mortgage. They may have a pretty piece of paper that it looks formal, it's got all kinds of fancy you know, words on it. You want to have a stamp like it was recorded in the state county, uh, in the county's public record someplace. Fine, it's just a piece of paper until the facts about who created it, when they created it, why they created it, under what terms it was created, that piece of paper doesn't prove any right. That's just the nature of the beast. The discovery of getting facts is the way you beat these people. The, the note uh, can be transferred. Uh, it can be, if I'm the boss of the note, and I use that term all the time, just because 
somewhat, something I coined when I was writing the book, but the UCC doesn't have a single label that applies to uh, who has the right to always enforce the note. It's, there are too many, it's almost like reading the Internal Revenue Code, which <laughs> most of you may not have done, but I did that. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the law is, is fragmented. One definition here uh, references two sections over here, three sections here, two, and you go right around. But the long and short of it is that the, the boss of the note is the concept. There's only one person at any one time in the history of your note that has the right. And the right to be the boss and control what happens with that instrument can change. If there's a sale, it can transfer to the next person. That person can sell it, maybe it transfers, maybe it doesn't. It all depends on the facts. And the foreclosure machine has terrible trouble proving the facts. They show up with just a, a smudging of uh, papers. Now that's a Texas word, I don't know if they'll use smudging. <laughs> but uh, but they, they'll show up with a, uh, just the assignment document. They'll show up with a, uh, a copy of the note, not even the original, a copy, and it'll show, they'll say, well, it's got an endorsement on it, so I, I got it because it's got a blank endorsement or a special endorsement, those special terms. Uh, the bottom line is, until all the proof comes out about what they actually have, where they got it, how they got it, who they got it from, whether they got it from somebody that was the boss. Uh, bottom line is they haven't proven anything. And that's what comes out in courts all across the country. The UCC is becoming more and more the main way to attack the foreclosure machine. So the, the borrower has more options than what they're led to believe by the, the banks and the foreclosure machines. It's not as simple as uh, do what we say or else. Uh, a good lawsuit uh, can enhance the chances of a good settlement, Some, a meaningful uh, modification that's actually affordable instead of just something that puts the person under more pressure for, for the short fuse. Uh, and in many instances, the foreclosure machine does not win. Just that simple. So, so that's the essence of what I do. And I do think our courts can help. And I do think that that's probably the only short term solution is to go to court and help your judge and pick on these guys. <laughs> <laughs> My wife tells me that say, pick, picking on the, on the four-player machine is not really that bad because usually we think about picking on somebody that's smaller than <laughs> <laughs> Yes? Robert, did you, um, have you, in your research, have you come across any cases where uh, the homeowner has won in Mexico? In New Mexico? Yeah. Oh, uh, New Mexico doesn't have many published decisions in the, in the traditional sense, the appellate decisions. But uh, I had a judgment that was vacated just uh, a few months ago that I was having an attorney with here. I uh, know several cases where that's happened, and uh, I've seen quite a few motions that were denied. Where, uh, the foreclosure machine had put forward motions that had been denied where the judges are starting to get it. So I'm inclined to think that there, you know, there are some wins that are taking place. Yes. Do these mistakes have to do this is not the time for questions. Please write down your questions and turn them in. Oh, okay. I think that's right. <laughs> I think there's going to be a formal.